1876, the gang of Big Jim Keneally, a counterfeiting group, was having hard times. Sam Boyd, who was their engraver, had been arrested and sent to prison. They weren't able to do their operations, and they decided to take a desperate measure. They plotted to steal the body of Abraham Lincoln. The plan was to take Lincoln's body, take it in a wagon up to Indiana Dunes, hide it there, demand $200,000 ransom, and the release of Sam Boyd from jail. In order to do the caper, they recruited a man named Louis Swagels to be part of the team. They decided to act on November the 7th, 1876, because that was the night of the Hayes-Tilden presidential election, and they figured everybody in Springfield, Illinois, will be busy with the election and won't notice what's going on. They made it out to Oak Ridge Cemetery. They sawed off the chain that was locking the crypt. They got in, they got the lid of the sarcophagus off, and they were trying to pry the coffin of Lincoln loose when Swagels stepped outside to get the wagon, he said, and signaled the eight undercover agents that he was leading to arrest Big Jim Keneally and his gang. In the confusion, they got away that night, but all of them were arrested and they were all given the maximum sentence for the crime in those days, one year in prison. Please look with me at Luke chapter 22, and stand as you're able for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Luke 22, 7 and following is our scripture. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. They asked him, where do you want us to make preparation for it? Listen, he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a, a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I have come among you as a servant." You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you just as my Father has conferred on me a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. All right, this is Mystery Sunday, and I've already presented you with two mysteries to solve. First of all, why start with a story about stealing Abraham Lincoln's body in Springfield? And then secondly, as we begin the season of Advent, why start with this scripture about the Last Supper and the other end of Jesus' ministry? You know, we know that Advent is that Christian season that prepares us for the birth of Christ that happened some 2,000 years ago. And yet Advent starts with a look at the end of Christ's ministry rather than at the beginning of the ministry. 
Now, perhaps you've already solved the mystery, or maybe you're just convinced I'm a little weird and I don't always make sense in my sermons anyway. I haven't been taking any medication or anything, I assure you. Or I could be doing what my professor of preaching said you're supposed to do in a sermon. You make a big mess at the beginning, and then by the end you clean up everything, and it all makes sense, tied up in a nice little package. Well, the key to the solution to the first two mysteries is found in a third mystery. What kind of literature are the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have left us these accounts of the birth, the life, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. And scholars and Christians from the very beginning, right after they were written, I'm sure, have argued about what kind of literature are these. If you understand what kind of literature something is, you can better understand how to read it, how to hear its message, how to take that message and apply it in life. Some have argued that the Gospels are closest to history accounts. And yet, history typically takes a period of time and focuses on that, whereas the Gospels are focused on one individual primarily. Others say they are hagiography, which is the writing about the saints. You know, you have all these writings about the different saints that often came from the Middle Ages and later, and they often accumulated legends. The saint did this miracle and did this thing and did this other thing, and, and there's often a lot of kind of a, uh, maybe doubtful stuff that are a part of those. And yet the Gospels don't have the air of hagiography. They have a realistic presentation. They've been confirmed again and again in their details. They present something not as a focus upon wow, but as a focus upon this is important to know. Perhaps the best argument can be that the Gospels are like biography. You know, biography is the story of a person's life, why that person is important, how that person impacts the world around them, why that person has a continuing legacy. Now, I have on my shelf at home several biographies of Abraham Lincoln. There's a lot of them that are out there, and some very good ones. They tell the story of Lincoln's life. They tell why he's important. They tell the impact that he has had. But in a sense, the Gospels are not really like biographies. Maybe a biography of Lincoln or Martin Luther King Jr. or John F. Kennedy. No, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote Gospels, and there is a distinction. See, biography is about a person in history, and often when a biography is written, that person is dead and gone. Now, their impact may live on, I mean, you know, you don't have to go very far in Illinois to see Lincoln on license plates and parks and towns and all over. And same in Indiana and Kentucky, the impact they had on the history of our nation might linger on. But Lincoln is dead, and we know that. His body really is in Springfield, and I guess theoretically, if you could get it out of the sarcophagus, you could steal it. But the Gospels are different in that way. Because the Gospels are about someone who died, and yet his grave is empty. Someone who lived long ago and continues to have impact, and yet continues to come into people's lives as a living Lord today. The Gospels are not about a dead hero. They're about someone who is available to have a relationship with here and now. So that solves that mystery, at least those first two, but then it leads to a third mystery. Why do we start Advent with the Lord's Supper? Why do we start Advent with the sacrifice of Christ, the, the coming of Christ and his sharing with his disciples, his gathering at the end of his public ministry to have that special meal that we celebrate still, that we will celebrate today? as part of our worship. See, that's the real importance of why we are here and what it's about. Remember, Advent, from the very name, is the coming, the entering in into the world of Christ, the arrival, if you will, of Christ. And we know that Jesus came long ago as a baby. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. And we know that Jesus will come again according to his promise as Lord 
of lords and king of kings, as judge of all humanity. He will put an end to evil and death and sin. He will set up an eternal kingdom to the glory of God the Father. But in between those two dates is the time that's really the most important for us. And that's the time where Jesus is available to come into our hearts, to come into our lives, to come into who we are and to transform us. And the fact is, if you miss this advent, the coming of Christ into your heart, the other two really don't matter that much. I mean, Christmas, if you don't have Christ in your heart, is just a fun time to have lights and presents and special food and sing happy songs. And if you don't have Christ in your heart, you will fear his return to put an end to history, to come as King of kings and Lord of lords, rather than anticipating and welcoming it. The vital prerequisite for celebrating Advent is to welcome Christ now. And the good news of the gospel is Jesus is alive and available to come into your life now. The Last Supper, as we're told in these verses, was a Passover meal with the disciples. It was a time to celebrate how God had delivered the people of Israel way back before that time from slavery in Egypt. How he had performed plagues in order to get the Pharaoh to let them go. How that final plague was the angel of death and the blood of the lamb and the doorpost caused it to pass over the households of the Israelites so that they would be delivered from Egypt. The disciples didn't get it that first last or that first Lord's Supper, that last supper time. They didn't fully realize that one greater than Moses and his deliverance of Israel was sitting at the table with them. They didn't catch it that it would be Jesus' own blood rather than that of the Passover lamb that would protect them, that would deliver them, not from earthly slavery, but from eternal slavery, from sin and death, the power to live on, not just from temporary bondage, but forever. They don't get it, and they argue who's going to replace Jesus well, he's still sitting at the table with them. Who's the greatest? Who's going to take charge next if he's going to disappear? You know, when my kids were like 10 and 8, I came walking into the kitchen, and they were discussing which one of them was going to get which one of my belongings when I died. And I said, you know, I'm feeling pretty good right now. You guys might want to wait a little while before you discuss that. Just like kids, they argue over the inheritance well, Jesus is still there. They don't get it, but all but one of them will eventually get it. That he is about to sacrifice himself. That he might be the eternal living Lord. Available to come into the hearts of all his people. Available to be their Lord. So Advent is really about the Jesus coming into our hearts. About that offer that all of us get to allow him to, to invite him to, to be open to that, to receive the gift of salvation. It's not just lights and gifts and a cute baby. It's about one who died for you. You know, they have those old Jesus movies from the 60s and 70s, and I can't remember which one it is, but there's one of them where Jesus is lying in the manger, and in the background you hear somebody reciting the 22nd Psalm. That's the one that starts out with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it really describes the crucifixion. And as you look closely at the scene, there's a shadow of a cross across the baby lying in the manger. That from the very beginning, he comes that he might lay down his life for us. Advent's not something about someone long ago that might have influence or inspiration or be an example. It's about Christ coming to our heart today. It's about receiving what he has done for us today. It's not just about nostalgia or memories. It's about the decision we make to follow him. And we're going to have some folks, some young folks come and be baptized in just a few minutes. And that is that decision to 
respond to Christ when he says, come, take up your cross and follow me. Come to me, you that are weary and downtrodden. Come to me for life. Come to me for light and bread and a shepherd and all those things that he promises. Who is this man the angels acclaim? He's our only hope for life, our only hope for eternal life, the one who comes that we might have a place in God's family. The biggest mystery, the one that only you can solve, is will you respond to that invitation of Christ? Or will you keep putting it off, keep denying it, keep fighting against it? Will you open your heart and receive what Christ has done for you? Will you welcome the coming of Christ into your heart. Once you make that decision, it gives a whole new light to the season of Advent, to the time of Christmas, to the celebration of Easter, to those many Easter's that we do, M-I-N-I, many Easter's all year long on Sunday morning when we celebrate, <coughs> excuse me, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. It gives a whole new direction. And you can anticipate then his coming again in glory and in power. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible love and all the ways that you have shown that, most of all through our Lord Jesus Christ, that came that we might have life, that came to give his life, that we might be a part of your family. Lord, help us to trust and to welcome the coming of Christ in our lives. We thank you for your love. We thank you for those promises. We thank you for the hope that that brings. Help us to be your people, claimed by Jesus, welcoming him in all aspects of life. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.